looking ahead to the, the uh, third and final panel beforehand, we wanted to spend a few minutes chatting with Professor Adam Mossoff, who I'll introduce very briefly, um, about <laughs> the uh, practical implications, as he sees it, of the oil state's decision on intellectual property. Now, of course, intellectual property is something uh, that Professor Mossoff knows very well. After all, he is a professor of law at the Scalia Law School, and he also founded and directs the Center for the Protection of Intellectual Property. Not just the Center for the Study of Intellectual Property, but the Center for the Protection of Intellectual Property, where he and his colleagues have really been at the forefront uh, before the oil states case and now after it in, uh, in, in developing scholarship and policy arguments surrounding uh, modern intellectual property. And so we thought it would be a nice opportunity after having talked about both uh, adjudication in very general terms and even the oil states case in very general terms to uh, have this conversation. Now I'll say last year, our two centers, the Center for the Protection of Intellectual Property and the Center for the Study of the Administrative State, had a private workshop and a public conference specifically on the Patent Trial and Appeals Board in the run-up to oil states. In fact, if I remember correctly, I think they granted cert in oil states the day of our workshop, maybe? It's um, the day of the, oh, you mean back in the early spring? Yeah, yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. and, um, and so anyway, Adam, uh, just very generally, very interested to hear your thoughts on uh, the case, but also very more specifically, the case's ramifications for intellectual property. Right. Well, thank you, Adam, and I already, uh, told Adam that I, I, it was with great trepidation that he asked me to speak following uh, my professor and mentor and, and friend Richard. Um, uh, because if you know, if you could think of Richard's presentation as as you know as your rib or your steak meal, my presentation will come across as your delightfully light and fluffy yeah. tiramisu. Um, so, um, <laughs> because that is that that is always the case with anyone who must follow um, uh, Richard, who is just uh, brilliant on so many levels. And um, <clears throat> that's actually why we picked you. No, none of the panelists on the next panel wanted to jump into the fray. and, and wanted kidding. to be tiramisu. <laughs> just so, and and I'm always happy to be kind of the the past law geek, uh, you know, uh, party crasher, um, you know, among the uh, constitutional law and administrative law specialists. In fact, that's been kind of the pattern, actually, with intellectual property uh, law through history, in fact, is that there actually has been this interesting relationship between intellectual property and patent law, and specific, specifically, and administrative law and constitutional law. Many people don't realize this, that um, intellectual property played a key role, actually, at the turn of the century in a lot of the original theoretical work that was being done by legal realists and early uh, political progressives at the turn of the century when they were creating the very structure of the modern administrative state in reconceptualizing property. Um, I wrote on this about 10 years ago called The Use and Abuse of IP at the Birth of the Modern Administrative State, and where I talked about how very uh, uh, well-known theorists, uh, Felix uh, Cohen and Morris Cohen, and even uh, J Justice Holmes and others, used intellectual property to reframe property rights in land as a right to exclude. Right, which then all your all the other incidents of property rights of use, disposition, and whatnot could be actually freely uh, regulated, restricted, and controlled by the administrative state without implicating the constitutional protections under the due process clause or the takings clause for those property interests in land. And they used as a frame of reference for doing that intellectual property. Um, and uh, and so once more, about a hundred years later, we are at a point in time now where. Um, Kind of like uh, you know the, the the delightful cute geek in the John Hughes uh, coming of age movies from the 1980s that always pop into the party and and you know and everyone's wondering what's he doing there and he actually ends up being fundamental to the story that's being told. Um, you know the patent law guy arrives at the intersection of patent law or constitutional law and administrative law um, in a very important key case, the oil states, um, which has tremendous ramifications even beyond intellectual property. Um, and and. Uh, and Richard really uh, uh, you know, covered uh, many of those aspects of it, that it has uh, tremendous implications if you follow the, the, the logic of Justice Thomas's decision through, um, that it doesn't just impact intellectual property, um, it actually impacts all uh, property rights and, and throws them to the vagaries of the administrative state and, and agency adjudication. Well, um, I guess I'd ask first and foremost, the court's decision, the majority opinion in oil states seemed pretty categorical. I mean, What's the sort of aftermath of that? Is there, enter, is there any way, you know, since you file briefs, you write papers, is there any way that you see the sort of tracking the court back towards 
you know, if not the best option, maybe a second best option. I'm just yeah. really curious what comes next. So, um, I mean, that was part that was part of the surprising aspect of the opinion is how categorical it was. I mean, and and this, and the breadth of his of uh, Justice Thomas's. Uh, Claim that patents are public rights, are you know, are special privileges accorded by the government, and, class, and thus the classic adage applies: "What the government giveth, the government can taketh away." Um, he does throw this little bone at the very end in his final paragraph, where he says, "Oh, and by the way, this doesn't have any implications for due process or takings claims," um, and um, which, by the way virtually guarantees now that there will be due process and takings arguments being asserted against the PTAB. In fact, those cases have been asserted. Um, in fact, this is, oil states was a little bit of a surprise because almost all of the challenges, other than oil states, against the PTAB up until that point in time had been on grounds of due process violations or takings claims. And, um, and, the, and the Supreme Court had been denying cert on that. Um, I think there, I have a theory that they granted cert on the oil states case because the oil states case was not about the public-private right distinction. It was really about whether this is a violation of the jury trial right under the Seventh Amendment of, of owners of patents to have their property rights adjudicated by an Article III court with the, with the right of jury. Um, and I, I have a theory that that certain justices in the court who are very skeptical of, of IP um, grant, you know, convince the other justices to grant cert on that question because that constrained them to the Seventh Amendment arguments yeah. uh, and uh, as distinguished from the due process and takings clause arguments and that made it harder thus to make the, make the arguments you needed to make in, in the case that the PTAB was unconstitutional. So when, when Professor Epstein says that that the future really will be sort of looking squarely at the due process issues. You agree that that's right. I mean, because that's actually been front and center before both the Supreme Court and the the Court of Appeals for the Federal Circuit, which is the federal appellate court that is, hears all patent appeals. Uh, they've been referring to this uh, repeatedly over the past several years, uh, and the word that they've been using is shenanigans. Is what's been happening at the PTAB. I mean, because I, I mean, it, it's hard to uh, to characterize this to most lawyers and and, and political elites. You know. What Congress did in 2011 when it created the PTAB, it created an agency that had no structural limits imposed upon it other than the, the requirement that it cancel patents that it finds to be invalid. And so um, there have been stacking of panels. So there was one very famous case before the PTAB, the, the, you know, the, three, the original three judge administrative law uh, judge panel, or administrative patent judge panels, they're called APJs, um, found the patent to be valid. And, um, and the chief judge of the PTAB added two more judges to the panel. And so you had a five judge panel, and they found the patent to be valid again. And apparently that was not the right answer, because then they added two more judges to the panel and told them to rehear the case. So now you had a seven judge panel, and they finally found the patent to be valid, and now that, or invalid. And the chief judge said, now you got the right decision. Thank you very much. I'm not going to stack the panel anymore. Um, you've, you've had um, serial petitions being filed. So with the exact same arguments, I mean, literally, I mean, uh, the, the, the people have looked at this, people are literally copying and pasting the exact same petitions. So the same patent owner will have 30, 40, 50 PTAB petitions filed against them at the PTAB to invalidate their patent. Because this is being done by, by people who want to infringe the patents, and they're just trying to impose costs on patent owners through this agency. Also, it has what we refer to colloquially as kill rates, as high as 98% um, in one aspect of one, one of the types of proceedings, and as, and as low as 70% uh, in other types of proceedings. So you know, for patent owners to be brought before the PTAB, it's a serious threat to your property rights. And there's no procedural protections. There's no substantive protections for your property rights. I mean, it really is an out of control agency in every respect. Yeah. Uh, if I heard correctly, you said a moment ago that it's not just about intellectual property, that now other areas of law or the types of property might be at issue. Would you like to elaborate on that a little bit? Well, yes. I mean, because it goes to Professor Berman's question earlier uh, to uh, to uh, Richard about, you know, well, aren't patents somehow different from trademarks and other types of rights? And um, and this is actually the sole basis. The entire argument by Justice Thomas in oil states that patents are public rights is that they're statutory grants um, not found at common law. And, uh, and um, the, the problem with that type of division is that it's very procrustean. It's very simplistic. Because actually, most rights, including our property rights in land, um, are born of both statutes and common law ju judicial decision making. I mean, we all, I mean, I teach first year property, so we all learn in our first year property course that the, actually the start of what we now know to be the fee simple in land, the, the full dominion, is the you know, statute of quae em Taurus, enacted by parliament in 1290, which begins the process of free alienation. And before that, there was the statute of Gloucester of 1287, which established waste doctrine against life tenants. And after that, there was the, you know, the, the statute of, um, of, of you know, will 
Mills in 1540 and the statute of um, ten years, the Ten Years Ab Ab Abolition Act of 1660. I mean, statute, statutory enactments in Parliament and continuing up through the United States, statutory enactments and adverse possession and defining the types of estates we have and the types of interests have been fundamental to defining the very core nature of our interests in land, which people think of as kind of core classic common law rights. And in fact, almost everyone today owns a their property rights in land, if you trace your title all the way back to the first uh, to the first right, to a patent grant from the federal government or a state government, because patents are the ways to which these, these rights are first issued, it's the legal mechanism. Um, and in fact, most property owners today, west of uh, you know of the mid of the Midwest, own their property rights rooted in the Homestead Acts, which is federal legislation which created property rights. And in fact, just like Patent Act set specific conditions on the receipt of those property rights. So in fact, you didn't receive a property right, right away. It took five years to vest. And you, had to, you weren't allowed to sell it. And if you did sell it within that five-year period, your interest was voided. Um, you had to farm it and to develop it yourself. And, um, and you had to sign affidavits to testing to this after five years before the interest vested as a fee simple. So you know, the types of conditions and, uh, that, that are imposed upon patent owners, as, as Richard very ably described them, exist, existed for property owners and most property owners in the initial creation of property rights in land, which we normally think of as common law property rights. And it's this kind of, so it's a simplistic division between statutes versus so-called common law rights that really threatens to encompass all property rights and bring them within the sway of the administrative state and within the more arbitrary political decision-making processes of the executive branch. Yeah, as you explained that it, to me, it just occurs to me that in the, the more recent regulatory takings cases, right, there was sort yeah. of this circular question of, did you have a property right? Well, it depended in part on the background principles of law, which was a mix, I think, uh, of common law and statutes, right? So you yes. didn't have... Anyway. Right, so they would say, oh, well, if the zoning system existed before, then you already understood you had restrictions on your rights now, and this is just an, another type of restriction, and so this is consistent with exactly the types of interest you've been granted, and exactly, so you're seeing the same thing happen to patents, and this is very important because, you know, uh, if anything, because, you know, the, the, the United States was unique. We, one of the ways we broke from England, not just in our political structure of our government, was in our patent system. I mean, England had a patent system before, but theirs was a very discretionary royal prerogative grant um, system. And we said, no, these are gonna be private rights and property. We're, once they vest, you can enter into the marketplace, you can alienate them, you can transfer them, you can slice and dice them up in any way you want, you can embrace the, the division of labor and specialization in the free market. And this is, and, and, and economists and historians have shown that this was fundamental um, to the success of the U.S. innovation economy in the 19th century. Um, and in fact, other countries then modeled their patent systems after ours because we created a system of private rights in property, in inventions. Um, and we are now removing that foundation and throwing patents again into a, a, back into what they originally were in England, which was regulatory entitlements and, um, and subject to both the you know, procedural and substantive vagaries that come with that. Yeah. And that's, and they, therefore, you're kind of undergirt, you're, you're removing the, those vital foundations of that stable platform that property rights provide for an innovation economy. Well, it's, um, it, just a couple of weeks ago on Constitution Day, the American Enterprise Institute did a, they, their annual speaker this year with Diana Schaub, mm -hmm. who spoke about the Constitution and patents and inventions and mm -hmm. science and sort of bringing it all back to the framers. But anyway, just one minute left before we go on to the next panel. At risk of turning this into a total infomercial, uh, what else is your center working on these days? <laughs> Thank you. Uh, actually, I see Richard actually has been dying to ask a question. So, uh, with, 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 do you want to? You yeah, sure. Really quick, and then we'll go to the next well, panel. I don't know if it's a question or an addition, but let me mention two points. One is when Arnold Plan did his study showing that patents had no effect. He only did it on the English system and not on the American system. And that influenced people like Ronald Coase when he came over here to write about this years later, never understanding the difference. Mm -hmm. And the second question I want to make about the incorporation of statutes into common law, one of the issues that you had to worry about was that when the American Constitution, when the American break took place in New York, they said the common law of New York shall be the law of England as it existed on July 2nd, 19, yeah. 1776. And the question that you had to ask was whether or not uh, De Donis Conditionalbus, the thing that got rid of the futail, was part of the common law. And what the answer was, of course it is. Because we can't conceive of how we're going to run titles if a statute that, that's fundamental is going to be stripped away so that every grant is going to be read in a different way. Uh, so you, you didn't mention De Donis in your yes. earlier remarks, <laughs> but it basically reinforces the same position. And the naivete about land is one of the reasons why we get these artificial contracts with contrasting patterns. Yeah, I agree. I mean, I mean, we all are on our first-year property course that 
property rights are not land. It's property rights are the rights in a particular asset, valued asset in the world, whether in that, and you can have valued assets in air and water and in, in fish and animals and sea and all sorts of things and, and inventions and books. Yes, the subject matter is different from other types of materials and so the way we structure the rights are different, but nonetheless, the key is to recognize the property rights in those new valued creations that come from people. Right. Well, thank you very much. Uh, thank you. Please join me in. Thank you. Thank you.